بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم افتح علينا بحكمتك وانشر علينا برحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله عدد كمال الله كما يليق بكماله يا عليم علمنا من علمك ما ترضى به عنا ولا تؤاخذنا بما تعلمه منا يا حليم خلقنا بخلق الحلم وحققنا بحقائق العلم سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم we continue tonight with the positive attributes, the substantive, substantive attributes of God. And I believe tonight that we can begin by talking about verse 9. God's hearing, sight, and uncreated speech, their proof, the learned have passed down to us. We talked about that a little bit last night, and inshallah tonight we can talk about that in greater detail. So we have then the seven positive attributes, which are fundamental descriptions of God, which if a person does not understand them, we believe their knowledge to be very inadequate. God is infinite, He has infinite attributes, but these are extremely important basic attributes. Life, knowledge, will, and power. Then tonight we have hearing, seeing, and speech. Life is that attribute of God that makes Him a personal God, and that also validates these other attributes such as choice, will, knowledge and power. Knowledge is the total manifestation to God of all things known, all things that will be, all things that will not be and could have been, all things that are necessary, all things that are impossible. It is the totality of all that could be known, right and wrong, impossible and necessary, created and uncreated. And that knowledge is made manifest to him from pre-existence. And it has one relation, as we said, which our, the our theologians call ta'alluqun tenfidiyun qadim. It has one pre-existent, efficient relation, meaning that all of these things are known to God from before time absolutely known to him. Not in order, not in sequence, they're not learned, they are not um, uh, in any way like the kind of things that we know. So this is divine knowledge, it is active knowledge, it is creative knowledge. His will functions in the realm of possible being on the basis of that knowledge. So God knows all possibilities. He knows from the beginning of time all of the possibilities that describe the reality that we live in at this moment and at any moment before this moment and any moment after this moment and all the other possibilities that might have been instead. God knew that also and his will designates what will be the choices for creation. So his will has two relations. One of them is pre-existent efficient. In Arabic, we say tenfidiyun qadim, which is that he decides that this cup will be, that you will be, that this world will be as it is. It is the effective, efficient working of his will to choose that will be, that which will be, and that which will be as vast as it is, it is like a drop in the sea 
of all the other possibilities that might have been instead. And those possibilities, which are not created at the moment and may never be created, those God's will also relates to. And it relates to them, we say, in a way that is suluhiyun qadim, a way that is pre-existent sufficient, that God knew all the possibilities, so there was not a possibility that he did not know, which if he had known, it would have been a better choice, and he could have made the world a better world. Uh, this is the nature of will. And we say that لَيْسَ فِي الْإِمْكَانِ خَيْرٌ مِمَّا كَانِ because of the fact that in creating this world, although this world is a place of trial and tribulation and of difficulty and of good and evil and of suffering and joy, it is the perfect test that God has ordained. And therefore we accept it with that kind of wisdom. Um, tomorrow night, inshallah, we hope to talk about good and evil. So we can also talk about good and evil in this context and how we relate to it. Then we have the attribute of power. And as we said yesterday, the function of power is that it executes the will of God. Those things in possible being that God willed to create in their particular place and time, according to their particular attributes, God creates them at the time designated by power. Power gives existence and it takes existence away. We say that power also has two cosmic relations. One of those is suluhi qadim. It is sufficient pre-existent that God is perfect creator at all times, even before the creation. And he could have created at any time. And he could have created anything at any time. So his power was never in any way deficient. It was never in any way uh, absent. And then he creates things in time and place, at the time and place that was designated by his will. And that relationship we call tenfidiyun hadith. So it's different. It is tenfidi hadith. Efficient but temporal. And the temporality of it is the act of creation in time. It is not a temporality which is in God himself, who is utterly contrary to all that which has a beginning and an end and is caused. We speak in Islam about al-qada, the decree, and we talk about al-qadr, destiny. And al-qada is a function of divine will. It is the manifestation of the pre-existent efficient will of God, that he has decreed that these things will be. He has decreed that you will be born, that your life will be of a certain length, that your provision will be of a certain amount, that you will marry a particular person, that you will have certain children, that they will have children, and so forth. All of that is a function of divine will. And it is efficient will because it is the choice that was taken as opposed to the many other alternative choices. And then the actual occurrence of that in history, in time and place, that is a function of qadr, of destiny. Um, this always raises the question of free will, and tomorrow night, inshallah, we want to talk about that, free will and good and evil, and also causation. So then tonight, we take these other attributes, hearing, seeing, and speech. And as he says, دَلِيلُهَا نَقَلَهُ الْأَعْلَامُ So the proof for this was transmitted by our scholars. They're the ones who transmit to us the Qur'an. They're the ones who transmit the Hadith. They're the ones who transmit the whole legacy. And he means to say by that, <clears throat> as we explained yesterday, that our scholars, when they look at these different attributes, they believe that the human heart and the human mind, living, conscious, 
and intelligently in this world should be able to posit on its own without revelation that God exists and that he is one and that he has life, knowledge, will and power. But they believe that hearing, seeing and speech are attributes that many people might not necessarily posit even though they are perfections of God and they are corollaries, they are natural conclusions of necessary being, but they are basically revelation based because Allah tells us that he is Sami' and Basir and he tells us also that he speaks. Speech and, uh, you know, will, speech and hearing are a pair. So we have seven attributes. One of them doesn't have a pair, that is life. Okay, this is because it does not have any particular relationship to creation that is necessary. And then we have knowledge and speech. Those are a pair. We'll talk about why they are a pair in a few minutes. And then we have will and power. Will and power are a pair because they relate to creation. They relate to the formulation of existent things in the realm of possible being. And hearing and seeing are also pairs because they relate to the same thing. So in our theological tradition, we believe that hearing and seeing are those attributes of God that disclose perfectly all that exists. This is what they do. They manifest, they disclose to God in the most total and perfect way all that exists. Therefore, that which exists includes that which exists of necessity, that which exists as necessary being. God hears and sees himself. God exists. He hears and sees his attributes, his essence, his acts. And this is the most perfect and the most beautiful of all the things that God exists, that, that God sees and hears. And then in the world of creation, <clears throat> God hears and sees all things that are created at the time of their existence. Okay? Knowledge relates to all that is known, whether it exists or not, whether it is possible, necessary, or impossible. Um, hearing and seeing, on the other hand, they relate to the necessary existence of God. And God knows God. God has a full disclosure of himself and every aspect of himself. No one knows God as God knows God or like God knows God. No one hears him or sees him as he hears and sees himself. But also hearing and seeing are the complete disclosure of creation. <clears throat> At any moment of creation, from the beginning of history to the end of time, from the beginning of creation until the end of time. And so at all moments in the existence of time and space, God pre perceives perfectly all that is there. It is therefore an attribute of perception in this regard of the act of God, the work of God, the creation of God. And God sees all that he hears and he hears all that he sees. These are different attributes. We believe that they have a fundamentally different reality in disclosure, but whatever God sees, he also hears. So when we see, we see colors, we see shapes, we see shadows, we see bodies, we see movements, we don't see sounds. We don't see tastes, we don't see um, touches, we don't see smells, we don't see other things that exist. Uh, we have sight, but our sight is ocular. 
and it is related to light and to distance and you know I can't see beyond the pillar I can't see now in the other room God sees everything he sees colors he sees bodies he sees sounds he sees tastes and touches and smells and fragrances and all of the things that exist it is a total perception of existent reality and God hears all that he sees so that he also hears the body he hears the color he hears the shadow he hears all of the things that he sees and he hears sounds and he hears tastes and touches and smells and surfaces and all things that are there so this is the complete disclosure of reality and our hearing and seeing enables us to speak meaningfully about that we are not blind and we're not deaf but again his attributes are utterly different and they are totally perfect i see for example the surface of the table and i see only what comes to my attention i may miss so many things i don't have a complete perception even of the surface of the table i see but i don't see the different levels in the table i don't see the different parts of the table i don't see the molecules of the table i don't see the atoms of the table i don't see underneath the table i don't see the leg and inside the legs and so forth whereas god's hearing and seeing is a total disclosure of all that is as it is in conjunction with other things and also separate he sees the earth he sees in the earth he sees the heavens he sees all that is in the heavens okay so hearing and seeing then they relate to the existent that which is exists god relates to the world that he creates and they say that um his hearing and seeing has three relations one of them is tanfidhiyun qadim one of those is pre-existent efficient what does god see and hear in pre-existence what exists in pre-existence what would that be sorry god sees himself so his hearing and seeing manifest himself to himself in pre-existence and god has another hearing another relation in hearing and seeing which is said to be suluhi qadim which is pre-existent sufficient and that is his the reality that god is sufficiently perfect and complete that he can hear and see things even before they exist so he hears us now he sees us now he hears our hearts he sees our hearts he sees every part of us our intentions our outward our inward all aspects of our being and that quality that divine attribute was there from before the creation of the heavens and the earth even before the thing to be seen even before the thing to be heard and then god has the relation of his hearing and seeing to creation as it exists in the moments that it exists and that we call tanfidhiyun hadith we call that um efficient and temporal that in time and space God is the lord of time and space. He is the master of time and space and he relates to everything perfectly in time and space. But the nature of that relation which is the actual seeing of God and hearing of God of things in the times that they exist that is tanfidhiyun hadith. It is temporal and it is um efficient. It's a total disclosure. Okay so I think that might be enough about these attributes bi izni llahi ta'ala and from there inshallah we go to the attribute of divine speech kalam 
And kalam is the pair of knowledge. It relates to everything that knowledge relates to. God knows all that is possible, all that is impossible, all that is necessary, all mathematical relations, all geometrical relations, everything that is necessary, possible and impossible. He knows all of that. And the nature of his knowledge is to disclose. Its nature is keshf. It reveals that reality. Although in the case of God, there was never a time when it was undisclosed. It was always there. For us, disclosure often implies that there's a time when the thing was not disclosed. So in the case of God, that's not true. It is keshfun min ghayri khafa. It is absolute disclosure without any time or any dimension where the things were not known. His knowledge, his speech is like that too. His speech relates to all that is necessary, all that is possible, and all that is impossible. It relates to all that will be and all that might have been all that is and all that is not, all that will be, all that will not be. And it also relates to all necessary propositions. And it relates also to all impossibilities. Everything that God's knowledge relates to, his speech also relates to it. The difference being, in the language of our theologians, that the nature of speech is delala, it's not kesh. Speech points to that. Spe speech indicates that. And knowledge reveals it. So God's speech points to the knowledge that he has. And of course it can also point us to that knowledge. Because that is its purpose. That it gives us knowledge by directing us to the things that are in his knowledge. We believe that God's speech is a divine attribute. It is an attribute of his essence. Okay, so therefore all of these attributes as attributes of the essence of God, they are also clarified to us in our understanding by going through the six attributes we had before. Okay, so they are necessary. His hearing and seeing are necessary. That means they are uncaused. It means they are perfect. It means they are full. It means that they don't change and they don't diminish. And they never have contraries or opposites. There is nothing that God does not see. There is nothing that God does not hear in the realm of existence. Okay? And uh, then all of these attributes are also pre-existent. So they are from before before. Okay? They are from before creation. They are also everlasting, uncaused. They can never cease to be. Okay? They are also utterly dissimilar. So although we speak of ourselves as having these attributes, and these attributes for us are sometimes called um, the lordly attributes. as sifat rabbaniya Because you have life. You have knowledge. You have will, and your will is real. It is not metaphorical. And you have power. You have the power to act. We'll talk about that tomorrow. Okay? You have also hearing. You have seeing. Some people don't, but generally people do. And you have also speech. These are lordly attributes of human beings. These are the attributes of human beings that make us worthy of teklif. They make us worthy of moral and religious responsibility. They make us worthy of action and choice. They make us able to receive the amana, the trust of God. They make us also capable of being uh, the vistuants of God, the stewards of God, the khulafa of God on the earth. Okay, they're great attributes, and these are the attributes about which we will be asked, what did you do with them? 
Okay? Um, also for us, you know, we say that for God, knowledge is primary and then will is a function of that knowledge. So God makes the choices that he makes in the decree out of an infinite base of knowledge. Nothing, no possibility is unknown. And then he has power to create. And in a way, you are also, you have, we can speak of you in language that is somewhat similar, even though we're not similar. But if you have knowledge, you know, then you become very human in a dynamic way. And then you can have will, because you make proper choices on, based on wisdom and understanding. And then you can also have power. We have willpower, right? We have, when the more knowledge we have, the more that we understand, the stronger we become. The more informed we become. In many ways, the more human we become. become. Ignorance is darkness. Ignorance is not, it is our essential attribute, but we are given the possibility of knowledge. Okay? And then we have will. Out of knowledge comes will. And out of will also comes power. Okay, so these attributes then have, they're also self-sufficient attributes. They don't need tools. You have to have an eye to see. You have to have light to see. The bodies have to be at the right distance. There's so many conditions. But this is not true of the hearing and seeing of God. They're not conditioned by anything. They are also self-sufficient. And they're also one meaning that they are not made up of parts. You know, they are not the con compositions. And also that there's no plurality in the hearing and seeing itself, even though it relates to infinite multiplicity. Okay, when we come to speech, um, speech has uh, three relations. It has a relation a ta'alluq, which is tenfidiyun qadim, which is pre-existent and efficient. And this means that God, before the creation of the heavens and the earth, speaks of all that he knows. All that he knows, even about the fact that you will be, that you will be created, that this will be his will also to make you, all of that is known to God before the creation of the heavens and the earth. And God speaks of that also before the creation of the heavens and the earth. This is his self-attribute. And God also has a speech which is suluhi qadim. It is pre-existent and sufficient. And <clears throat> this is the validity with regard to God that he speaks to the prophets that he send revelation, that he send down law and guidance, that he command and prohibit. Although commands and prohibitions, they imply that there are beings there to be commanded and to be prohibited, but they're not created yet. So before their creation, God's speech is sufficient to speak to the messengers, to send revelation, uh, to speak to his angels, to speak to anything in creation that he wills. And then in history, when God speaks to creation through revelation, uh, that is the relation which is, we say, tenfidiyun hadith. It is temporal and efficient. He speaks to Moses. He speaks to Jesus. He speaks to Abraham. He speaks to his messengers and his prophets. He speaks to our Prophet ﷺ. So speech is a very important attribute of God and it is paired to knowledge. It relates to knowledge. In Islamic history, one of the most important theological debates was about the speech of God. And this is because the Mu'tazila held that divine speech could not possibly be pre-existent. It's got to be temporal. 
And they held that to be the case because in their conception, speech is language, speech is sound, speech is grammar, speech is composition. Certain words come before others, other words have to wait. All of those are descriptions, all of those are descriptions of possibilities. All of those are realities of possible being. All of those are temporal. Okay, so this became a very big issue. The position of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah was that God has various dimensions of speech. So that speech which is his attribute and that we're talking about tonight, it is necessary, uncreated, a function of necessary being, it is pre-existent, it has no beginning and it's not temporal, and it is eternal, it lasts forever, uncaused, and it is utterly dissimilar. So it is not linguistic speech, it is not Arabic, it is not Hebrew, it is not Syriac, it is not sound, it is not letters. It is a unique property of God which totally indicates that which is disclosed in his knowledge in a way that the reality of which only God knows. But it attaches to the totality of his knowledge. It is utterly dissimilar. So it is not like human speech. And then he has a speech which is, it is also self-sufficient. It doesn't need sound. It doesn't need letters. It doesn't need grammar. It doesn't need plurality. And it is one. So it is not, again, sounds and words and things like that. It is a total indication of what is absolutely revealed in divine knowledge with the same unicity the same lack of internal plurality and multiplicity that is characteristic of divine speech. As for the revealed books, the books that the scrolls of Abraham, the Dead Sea Scrolls, by the way, uh, give us information about the scrolls of Abraham, the scrolls of Moses, the Torah of Moses, the Psalms of David, the Dead Sea Scrolls also tell us that the Psalms of David were revelation and David was a prophet. That's not a problem for you as a Muslim. You always believe that. But for the people of the book, it is. It's one of their disputes. Was David a great king or was he also a prophet? And was Solomon a prophet? Some say that they were prophets and some say that no, they were kings. And so the Dead Sea Scrolls are very clear that the Psalms were revelation. There were more than 4,000 of them. Today there's only 150, as we said before. Okay, the Psalms of David, the Gospel of Jesus, the Qur'an of the Prophet Muhammad, they are divine speech. We refer to them that way. And in our tradition we will also say that the Qur'an is uncreated. But what do we mean by that? What we mean by that is that the letters of the Qur'an, the language of the Qur'an, the recitations of the Qur'an, the grammar of the Qur'an, the Arabic nature of the Qur'an, this is temporal. This is created. But it is created by God for his revelation. So it shares in the pre-existent world. And it reflects the pre-existent world. And we call it uncreated speech out of adab, out of courtesy, and also so that we don't cut the relation that is between the temporal speech of God created perfectly in reality to reflect his uncreated speech and be between that uncreated speech. And therefore, in, when we teach, for example, we make that very clear. But we speak of the Qur'an this way as adab. And we do not believe that the Qur'an that is written in the Mus'haf and that you write down on paper is pre-existent. It's not. It's temporal. That's a temporal act. Those are letters. Those are sounds. Yet, 
every word in the Qur'an and every word in every revealed book before that that is authentically revealed, it shares in the pre-existent speech. And for this reason, those of us who know the Qur'an and, you know, we understand the Qur'an and we receive it with knowledge and understanding and respect, we, 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 it's, it's endless. It always speaks to us in a new way. It always reveals new things. It is a source of infinite knowledge. And we take great commentaries like Ar-Razi's Tafsir, 30 volumes. And yet when we read this Tafsir, it's, it's as if it doesn't ever go as deep as it could go. It tells us so many things, but usually it's just on one level of interpretation. The Qur'an goes deeper and deeper and deeper. And that's because as the created speech of God revealed to the Prophet wasallam in perfect language that was created for that, then it shares in the pre-existent speech. And for that reason, those who know the Qur'an and who live in the Qur'an and who are purified and received it, it speaks to them infinitely. It tells them deeper and deeper meanings. And it, it's never boring. It never wears out. Okay? It's always new. It's always fresh. This is the nature of it. And the words of the Qur'an, although they are temporal and created and we can count them, we know how many verses there are, we know how many letters there are, we know how many surahs there are, you know, but in a way they're sort of like you know, a beautiful uh, lake, a crystal clear lake, you know, in the top of a mountain, you know, on a radiant night, you know, when all the stars are in the sky, and all the stars are also in the lake. You know, the lake perfectly re 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 reflects to us all the stars that are in the sky, even though those stars that are in the sky represent millions and millions of light years, their distances between them, their huge bodies, they're very diverse, but they're all there in the lake. The lake perfectly reflects it. So the Qur'an is like that too. The Qur'an perfectly reflects the knowledge of God, which is his pre-existent speech. Okay, and it gives us that great knowledge. Um, before God created us in this world, he brought us together in the plains of Arafat, as the Hadith tell us, and he took us out of the loins of our father Adam, and we were like dhar, we were like tiny ants. We were, very, we were like tiny atoms. Okay, and he put us all there. And then he said to us, Alestu bi rabbikum, am I not your Lord? When he spoke to us in that way, we heard the uncreated speech. However that happened, we do not know. What, how that worked with sound, whether it was language, but that was access that we had through the divine speech the divine khitab, to the uncreated speech. And for that reason, every human being who was there, and those were all human beings, good and bad, believer, disbeliever, you know, the divine speech was revealed to them and it was stamped on their nature. Our fitrah, our natural self, which is very good and which is full of knowledge and that knows God and it has knowledge of good and evil, it's from that. It bears on it the stamp of Alastu bi Rabbikum. You know, because when we heard that, that moment in timelessness, in space and time, then we receive access to divine knowledge which is unmentionable, which is vast. And this is the reality of the human being. This is why we are also ready to respond to that command, Alastu bi Rabbikum. Am I not your Lord? Which means that if I command you, will you not obey? If I prohibit you, will you not refrain? And I will give you guidance and I will um, 
give you all that you need for this. Okay, so we're ready for that. We receive the speech. When we go back to the garden, one of the most beautiful aspects of the garden is that Allah speaks to us. Salamun qawlam min Rabbin Rahim. God says to us, Salam. This is like the closing chapter of that vast history of our five lives that begins with Alastu bi Rabbikum. Am I not your Lord? And then he says, Salam. Perfect peace. You are safe. You made it. You did it. You obeyed me. And hearing that, Salamun qawlan. So this is Salam. It's not Salam as a state. It is not Salam like a man. It is Salam that is a word from a most merciful Lord. So again, that gives us access to this beautiful, uncreated speech. And that is the greatest ecstasy of all. It is said that when people in this world find something beautiful, a sound, a color, a bird, a shape, a design, or a relationship like mathematics or whatever it may be, that this is in reality their recollection or their tapping into the divine speech that they heard on the day of Alastu bi Rabbikum. Okay, so divine speech is the last of these attributes that we talk about. And with that, inshallah, we conclude the presentation of these seven basic attributes bi idhnillahi ta'ala. Let's see if we can go on and then tomorrow night, inshallah, we try to come back and um, I don't know how much we'll be able to do tomorrow, but the main thing is to talk about causation, free will and good and evil. Okay? I don't think that we'll be able to do more than that, unfortunately. Maybe we can say a few things in general. Then he says after that, وَجَائِزٌ عَلَيْهِ فِعْلُ مَا يُمْكِنُ أَوْ تَرْكُهُ فَالْتَعْلَمَا وَجَائِزٌ عَلَيْهِ فِعْلُ مَا يُمْكِنُ أَوْ تَرْكُهُ فَالْتَعْلَمَا لِأَنَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ فَرِيدُ فِي مُلْكِهِ يَفْعَلُ مَا يُرِيدُ So he says here, it is conceivable for God to do whatever is possible or leave it undone. Know this well. In the realm of possibility, which is the realm of creation, God has total freedom. Whatever he does, he does on the basis of infinite knowledge. Whatever he chooses to do, he does on the basis of wisdom. There is nothing mistaken about what he does. There is nothing foolish about what he does. There is nothing short-sighted about what he does. But God is absolutely free as the creator of the world to create whatever he wills and to do in the realm of possible being whatever he wills to do. And we cannot judge him in that. And we cannot put on him ethical constraints that are on us. I have to do what is good. You have to do what is good. But God creates, God is good. We'll talk about that tomorrow. But he creates whatever he wills. So he can create evil, and he does create evil. He can create Satan, and he does create Satan. He can create the garden, and he did create the garden. And he can create the fire, and he did create the fire. God can create people who are wealthy and people who are poor. God can create people who are happy and people who are sad. God can create people who have eyes to see, and he can create other people who do not have eyes to see. God is free as the Lord of the world to do in the realm of possible being whatever he does. And we respond to that in terms of sharia, in terms of law. We support the good, we fight the evil. We help people who are in trouble. We give sadaqah and charity, we do other things, but we do not judge God. And we have to be aware of the fact that whatever happens in reality, whether it pleases us or not, that it is the will of God. And it is the prerogative of God. It's his right and there is wisdom in it. Often in history that's very difficult. 
You know, we lose Palestine, for example. We lost Palestine to the Crusaders. We lost Palestine in 1948. That's a horrible thing, an absolutely horrible thing. And, you know, we have not been able to get it back, okay? But this has to be for the wisdom of God. We must do what is right. We must live by the religion. We must be good Muslims. This is a test. But we have to understand that whatever happens, whether it's the fall of Muslim Spain and Portugal, whatever it may be, uh, whether it's the difficulties that we live in in the moment, or whatever it be, that this is the will of God. We have to work. We have to do jihad. We have to do ijtihad, mujahada. We have to set things right. We're responsible for that. We're not passive. We don't say, God willed this, therefore I don't do anything. You know, but nevertheless, we have the understanding that however difficult our situation may be, that this is God's prerogative. And we have to understand that and we have to respond to it in the best way that we can. So it is conceivable for God to do whatever is possible or leave it utterly undone. He doesn't have to create angels. He doesn't have to create the garden. He doesn't have to send prophets. He sends them out of his bounty. He does whatever he wills. He can do it or not do it as he sees fit. It is not necessary that he send prophets. It is not obligatory upon God that he sends prophets. Okay, he does it out of his fadl. He does it out of his mercy. He does it out of his love. For God, glorified be he, is solitary in his dominion. He does whatever he wills. Um, some of the issues that came up here were the issue of good and evil and the issue of free will, which again, inshallah, we'll talk about tomorrow. I hope that we do a decent job of it. And um, also the issue of other things as well, like, for example, um, certain things that happen in the realm of possible being, uh, the Mu'tazila, who often are the ones who, because of their positions, they sort of forced Ahl-Sunnah wal Jama'ah to articulate their positions, uh, they also relate to that. The Mu'tazila would say, for example, that it is impossible that God be seen. So the Prophet has told us in Hadith that God will be with, that we will see God. The believers will see God in the garden. All men, women, and children will see God in the garden. All the believing human beings, all the believing jinn in the garden will see God. And also the Quran refers to that as well. Okay, so they would say this is not possible. In other words, it has to be metaphorical, it must be interpreted in another way. Uh, typically, the Mu'tazili positions are always because of the fact that they take human language as being, uh, what we could say, univocal. It has one meaning. It has one use. It doesn't have different levels. And therefore, in the response to this, usually what Ahl Sunnah and Jama'ah do is to emphasize the fact that these uh, that language has different levels and it has different meanings. What language means when we use it to refer to necessary being and when we use it to refer to God, that is not what language means when it refers to the world of analogy and possibly possible being. We just talked about the speech of God, for example. So for the Mu'tazila, speech is what I'm doing right now. That's speech, beginning and end. And so our scholars said, no. You know, there's also self-speech. She smiled her thanks. You know, speech is a meaning that is in the heart, which is articulated to others by sound. And I could do that by other ways. I could speak to you by my hands. I could speak to you by my face. Uh, I could speak to you by smiling, right? But the reality of speech is that it indicates the thing which is known here, the thing which is perceived in the heart. And so also when it comes to the issue of the vision of God, the beautiful vision of God in the garden, they would say that this is a reality that God creates 
It does not mean that God is a body. It doesn't mean that he has a size. It doesn't mean that you have to have the right color. It doesn't mean that you have to see everything or part of it. It is not, we're not talking here about ocular vision, you know, such as I have tonight when I look at you or look at me. But it is a revelation of God to himself in a special way that is a gift that he gives to the believers. And some of them would say that if you, were, if you asked the believer in the garden who sees God at the time that God reveals himself to him, if you asked him or her what their name was, they wouldn't be able to say. And some say it is a perception of God with the whole being. Some say it's a perception of God with the eye, but it's a special way. So again, we believe that that the promise that we will see God in the garden is absolutely true. But bila kaif, how will that be? We will know it, inshallah, when it happens. We believe in it, we do not doubt it. But it does not mean that God is a body, and it doesn't mean that my seeing God would be like my looking at you, for example. So this is also um, what comes under the rubric of the possible. And here, you know, we said that our creed was based, it's discursive, it's based on discursive knowledge, and it, it comes first and foremost from revelation, and then also it uses pure reason, sound intellect, and then also it uses the world of customary experience. So uh, here we're using the language of pure reason. That when we speak about the attributes of God, his existence, the negative attributes, the positive attributes, we call them necessary. They are part of the necessary being. They are corollaries of necessary being. They are, and they, they are hot, they are real, there's no question about them. But in terms of the way that intellect perceives them, they pertain to the realm of necessary being. So then what pertains to the realm of possibility about God, the creator, who creates the world of possible being? And here we say that he has totally free will, that his will is totally free. He does what is good because he is God. He does what is wise because everything that he does is based on infinite knowledge. But we are not there to judge him. And we cannot hold him to our expectations. And our ethical norms, which are very important for us, they are social and cultural. And they pertain to the needs you have and the needs I have and the rights you have and the rights I have. And to speak about God in analogy with that is not perfect. It is not correct. Okay? So uh, God in the realm of creation does whatever he wills. He is utterly free, but what he does is wise. What he does is good. It is a function of his perfection and his divine will. Okay, uh, let's, let's take this next verse and then I think we can stop for the evening, bi ta'ala, and then we'll come back tomorrow and we'll try to talk about these other questions that we haven't dealt with. So he says, وَضِدُّهَا مُمْتَنِعٌ ثُمَّ الْكَمَالُ لِلَّهِ وَالنَّقْسُ غَدَ لَهُ مُحَالُ The contraries of these attributes are impossible. Again, perfection belongs to God. Any deficiency for God has become impossible in your mind. So here they talk about that which is impossible. Um, that might strange. That might sound a little bit strange. Maybe it sounds a little bit impolite. Are certain things impossible for God? But here, when we speak about impossibility, we're talking about that which is impossible in reality regarding the right of God. So God is God, and He does not become non-God. He does not cease to exist. He does not cease to be perfect. 
Okay? The nature of necessary being is that it remains forever perfect as it is. In the realm of possible being, he does whatever he wills. Whatever he wills is good. Whatever he wills is wise. Okay? But he's utterly free. And there are no impossibilities in the realm of possible being. You know, he can turn the staff of Moses into a serpent. He can open the sea before Moses in 12 channels, because that's what happened. Moses takes his stick and he puts it on the sea, and there were 12 big channels that opened, and the sea came up like a wall of water, thousands of feet, thousands of meter tall, and the, wa and the land was dry underneath. And each of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel took its channel. This is the only way they could cross the sea. There are about 600,000 of them, or a million. They were a big group, but they have 12 tribes, and they move in their tribes. So the tribe of Reuben goes here, Issachar goes here, uh, Yehuda goes here, Benjamin here, and so forth. Okay? This is a miracle. This is contrary to customary experience, but it is not impossible. That is not impossible. The realm, the, the world of nature, and this is what we'll talk about t tomorrow when we talk about cause and effect, the things that happen here, they happen according to the sunnah of Allah. And things that we call laws, things that are customary experience, these are things that recur because they are the sunnah of Allah in creation. They are the pattern that he established. But Allah can change that pattern at will. And in the miracles of the prophets, that was, that's what he does. So Jesus can bring the dead to life. Jesus can walk on the water. Jesus can take clay and make it into a bird and breathe upon it and it becomes a bird and it flies away. The prophets can do these miracles, right? This is not impossible. This does not, in pure reason, pertain to impossibility. It pertains to the vast world of possibilities. But it is contrary to Ada. It is contrary to customary experience. Okay, so when we speak of the impossibility as relates to the right of God, Azza wa Jal, we are affirming the necessary attributes again. But we're saying that everything that contradicts those attributes or everything that is an opposite of those attributes, you have to know in your mind that it's impossible for you to regard that as valid. That is a mistake. God is not that way. So here, you know, we go through the 13 attributes again and we call to mind their contraries. Okay, so we'll try to do that in the next few minutes before we take a break. Okay? Existence is the first attribute of God. Necessary existence, perfect existence, unknowable existence, which is absolutely merciful, absolutely good, which is more apparent than anything and more hidden than anything at the same time. All of its contraries and opposites are invalid. They are wrong. They are not qualities of God, and in the language of reason we say they're impossible. They are impossible. They are impossibilities. Impossibilities um, for the human mind to accept. So therefore non-existence is invalid. God exists and no non-existence or aspect of non-existence, temporary existence or temporal existence caused existence, existence in space and time, interrupted existence, he ceases to be but then he comes back, less than perfect existence, greater or lesser degrees of existence, more perfect or less perfect aspects of existence, all of these are ruled out. Okay, this is the existence of God. So, in order to understand the necessary attributes of God, it's very important also to be conscious of their contraries and their opposites and to rule out their opposites. Do you know what the difference between an opposite and a contrary is? So we should probably say something about that, all right? So we have in uh, English and you have in Arabic 
opposites. And opposites are the food of the intellect. You know, the pure intellect, sound intellect. If ever it finds opposites, it can do amazing things. Contraries, no. Contraries it can't do the same with. Opposites are total contraries. And in Arabic we call opposites naqil. Naqil. So we say in Arabic what? Al-naqidani la yajtami'ani wa la yaftariqan. The two opposites, la yajtami'an. Two opposites can never come together. A thing cannot be described ever by two opposites at the same time in the same way. And naqidani la yajtami'an. They never come together. Wa la yaftariqan. Nor can they both be gone. They can't both separate. One of them's got to be true. Existence and non-existence are opposites. So this watch must have one of them. It's either got to have the attribute of existence or of non-existence. Impossible being always has non-existence. It can't have existence. Only one of the opposites can ever be true of it. Necessary being can only have existence. It will never have non-existence. That is incoherent. It is tahafut to think of that, right? So, al-naqidan are absolute contraries. They never can be together. The watch cannot be existent, non-existent at the same time. Here it is today. It exists. Okay, maybe something happens and it gets pulverized and tomorrow it doesn't exist. So it could non-exist, it did non-exist before it was created. But existence and non-existence are opposites with regard to it. And again, pure intellect loves opposites. It has a big collection of opposites because it can do amazing things with them. Temporality and Pre-existence are opposites. Okay? Temporality, huduth, al-wujudu ba'd al-adam, and qidam, which is wujud that is ghayr masbuk bi-adam. These are opposites, they're not contraries. And therefore, when I speak about causation, you know, and I see that the world is temporal, and that everything in it has a beginning, and therefore everything in it is muftaqir. Everything in it is contingent. It has to have an explanation. It has to have a cause. It cannot cause itself. Then we can talk about the Creator. But he must either have, he must either be pre-existent or he must be temporal like them. Once we establish that he cannot be temporal, there cannot be an infinite regress in finite causes, then he must be pre-existent. That's the way the intellect works. And it's very sound. Although today, as modern human beings, we're not accustomed to doing that. Other Earlier people were very accustomed to that. They wouldn't even need discussion. They get it just like that. Okay, so opposites are very important. Then you have contraries. Contraries are not total opposites. So we say, and we call them in Arabic, did or al-dad. So we say, al-diddani la yajtami'an. Black and white are what? Opposites or contraries? Contraries. So this is a white cup. It cannot be a black cup right now and still be white. We can paint it and make it black if we want, yes, but we can't have it black-white at the same time. It can be white and smooth, it can be white and rough, it can be white and full, it can be white and empty. But it cannot be white and black at the same time in the same way. It could be part white, part black. It cannot be totally white, totally black. It can be totally white and totally full, no problem. Okay, so black and white are contraries. Al-duddani la yajtami'an wa qad yaftariqan. But they can be separate. Okay, I'll get your question in one second. They can be separate. In other words, 
This is, if it's not a white cup, does it have to be a black cup? No, it could be green, it could be yellow, it could be transparent, it could be polka dot. It could be so many other things, okay? That's the way the contraries are. What is your question? Uh, uh, you, know, you could mix black and white together, you know, and get gray, right? You could mix blue and yellow and get green, okay? But it can't be black, white without, I mean, we can make it gray. We can take black paint, we can mix black paint with white paint and get gray paint and we can paint it gray. But the cup cannot be white as it is right now and it cannot be black like this is right now. Okay. They, it could be blue, it could be something else. Yes? <clears throat> well, I wasn't talking about that. I don't, that that's, that's something else. I hope that's true. I mean, my concept of reality is that we all see it's a white cup, but I don't know. I mean, what I see is white, is that what you see is black? I don't know. But in any case, whatever you say is white and I say is white, and we agree it's this, it cannot be what you say is black and I say is black. Okay, so here, when we talk about the impossibilities, we rule out all contraries and all opposites. We rule out all contraries and all opposites. The first negative attribute is Qidam, pre-existence. It is necessary. Established by revelation, established by pure reason, and established by scientific, scientific proof. So therefore, temporality is impossible. God is not a temporal being. He does not have the qualities of a temporal being. And that's why we say of him what we said before, that he's not in us, he's not outside of us. He's not to the right, he's not to the left. He is not physically close, he is not physically far away, although he is closer than Hablul Warid. But that's not physical closeness. He's not in me. Okay? So God is not temporal and he does not change. God is absolutely perfect, absolutely full. He changes. All change in the world is a manifestation and a proof of God. But God himself does not change. He has no genealogy. He doesn't have a father. He doesn't have a son. He doesn't have an uncle. He doesn't have a wife. He doesn't have a family. Um, he has no cause. That would also be a negation of pre-existence. Uh, he is not created. He is the creator. And again, how can that be? It must be. You know, the answer to that in pure intellect is that it is necessary. And everything that is necessary in pure intellect has no explanation. The axioms and the theorems of geometry, they don't have explanations. They are the explanations of everything else. That which is necessary about God explains to us the world. In it, this world exists, we have no doubt about it. It cannot exist of its own. It cannot explain itself. It cannot give an account of itself. And God has no determinate factors. There's nothing that changes him or makes him what he is, gives him divinity or takes it away. God is everlasting. He has al-baqa, okay, which is the counterpart of qidam. Whatever has qidam, it also has baqa. Because that which, that which makes it valid to say of God that he is Qadim, it also makes it valid to say of him that he is everlasting. So therefore God does not cease to exist. He never ceases to exist. He cannot be annihilated. He cannot be destroyed. Um, he cannot again have interrupted existence that would break his existence. And he doesn't change in that way. Dissimilarity is a necessary attribute of God. Therefore, all contraries and opposites of that are invalid. They are impossible in the language of pure reason. God is not male, he is not female, he is not neuter, he is not a gender, he is not a body, he is not in creation, he is not outside of creation, he is not imminent in the world, he is not transcendent, above the world. 
in another world. Um, God is not touching the world and not not touching. He is not in contact and not not in contact. We don't speak of him in those terms. Um, he is not nature. He is not a divine particle. Um, he is not change. Uh, he does not have color or smell or taste. Um, nothing is small or great with regard to God. And of course here we also speak again of the mutashabihat, the resemblant verses of the Qur'an which we talked about before. Self-sufficiency is a necessary attribute of God. Okay, so therefore he needs no lake locus, he needs no place, he is not situated in a place, he needs no helper, he needs no instrument, um, he needs no mechanisms, no eyes, no ears, no heart, no sleep, no rest, he does not become tired, he does not have a mind, he does not have an intellect, you know, he has perfect knowledge and he is perfect being and absolutely one. Uh, oneness is necessary for God, so therefore there is no duality, there is no trinity, there is no multiplicity, there is no plurality, not in God and not in anything like God in creation. Um, no parts, no partner, and so forth. Uh, then we come to the positive attributes. We'll go through those quickly. Life is a necessary attribute. Therefore, God does not die. And, you know, the outrageous statement of Friedrich Nietzsche in the 19th century that God is dead, um, what he meant by that, Allah knows. Maybe he meant to say that the belief in God is dead in the Christian world because there was lots of atheism and lots of materialism in that time. But to conceive of God dying is incoherent. This is not to understand the reality of God at all. And it is to place God in the realm of possible being. What happened to Nietzsche at the end of his life, by the way? You know, Nietzsche was a proud man. He was very intelligent. He was a master of the German language. Very few Germans have used the, the German language the way Nietzsche does. He was a master of the German language. And he's the one who spoke about the superman, the Übermensch. This is one of his teachings, the superman. And all the fascist teaching that comes out uh, of that, it owes something to Nietzsche. Uh, Nietzsche, maybe even some people say he believed he was that ubermensch. He was extremely intelligent. He was extremely gifted. And, you know, he said things about God. You know, he, he, a lot of times he's talking about Christianity, in fact. He said that if you took two things away from Germans, they would be the best people on the earth. He said, Christianity and beer. Christianity and beer. He said, take those away, the Germans will be really good. But um, Nietzsche, at the end of his life, the last ten years of his life, were hell. You know, he lost his sight, he lost his hearing, he lost most of his senses. Uh, these were, uh, it, it's from venereal disease, probably, and other things like that. But the end of his last ten years of his life, he just screamed all the time. You know, he, he could not see, he could not hear, he could not think. He could not communicate. That's the way the Übermensch ended his life. This is the one who said, God is dead. So, you know, when people say things like that, often something happens. You know, we have to have adab when we speak about God. Um, God is not a cosmic force. He is not energy. He is not natural law. You know, inshallah, tomorrow we'll talk about natural law. He is not a spirit. Um, you know, he has a life, and all of these attributes, as you know, they're understood in terms of the uh, five negative attributes. <laughs> knowledge is necessary. All contraries to this absolute knowledge are invalid. So, God does not learn. God does not forget. Um, God does not neglect. God does not overlook. Uh, God is not remiss. Uh, he does not dream, he does not lose consciousness, he does not conjecture, he does not, um, he's not preoccupied 
with one thing as opposed to another, and um, so forth. So again, we go through this as an exercise to clarify the nature of possible being and also to demark necessary being from that. God has perfect will, so there is no second will that is like his. There is no other will. There cannot be another universe in which there is another God. There's no room for that. His will pertains to all possibility, infinite possibility to the infinite degree. So there can be other universes and all un other universes are possible, but there cannot be another God for those universes because his necessary will, it must pertain to all possibilities which are all known in his knowledge. Um, also, we talk about causation here. So the basic belief of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah is that mechanical cause and natural cause are totally in the hands of God. The fire burns and you know it burns and you protect your house from fire. And um, poison kills and you know it kills and you protect yourself from it. But they don't do that in and of themselves. They do that by the will of God and the power of God. They are Ada. They are customary realities. They are the Sunnah of God. We respect them. We believe in it. We study them in science. We study medicine. And yet God does whatever he wills. If he wills that the fire be cool and safe for Abraham, then that's what it becomes. That is not impossible. This pertains to understanding the nature of possible being and how God relates to that. Um, God has power. Therefore, all contraries and opposites of that are invalid. He does not grow weak. He does not grow feeble. He does not grow old. He does not become sick. He does not become tired. He does not become exhausted. Um, hearing is his attribute. Uh, deafness. Any limitation in his total perception of reality is invalid with regard to him. He hears sounds and non-sounds. He hears all that exists. Seeing likewise. So blindness is impossible. It's invalid. Poor sight, limitation, oversight. Uh, speech is necessary. And uh, therefore God is never dumbstruck. He is never unable to speak. He is never speechless. Um, and the speech that he speaks is perfect speech, and it's meaningful speech. It reflects the infinite knowledge that he has, so he does not lie. There's also no false speech. Okay, let's end with that, the Ibnilani Ta'ala, and we take a break as we did before, and then uh, I'll, you have really good questions, very challenging questions, and I'll see what I can do with those, the Ibnilani Ta'ala. Allahumma wa fiqna lima tuhibbuhu wa tabda. واجعلنا من عبيدك السعداء وأمتنا على كلمة الهدى علمنا ما ينفعنا ووفقنا للعمل بما علمتنا به واجعل ما نحن فيه خالصا مخلصا لوجهك الكريم يا رب العالمين اللهم اجعل تجمعنا هذا تجمع مرحوما وتفرقنا بعده تفرق معصوما لا شقيا منا ولا محروما آمين 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 يا رب العالمين والسلام عليكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم افتح علينا بحكمتك وانشر علينا برحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم صل وسلم بارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم يا عليم علمنا من علمك ما ترضى به عنا ولا تآخذنا بما تعلمه منا يا حليم خلقنا بخلق الحلم وحققنا بحقائق العلم سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم Uh, can you elaborate about the part uh, concerning God's speech and language when it comes to the Qur'an? So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so when we talk about that, 
Um, God's speech is, um, first of all, an uncreated speech that is pre-existent, eternal, absolutely unlike anything in creation. It is not temporal and it is self-sufficient and it is utterly one. It doesn't have parts, it doesn't have pieces. Okay, and that is the most perfect speech of God. <clears throat> Everything that relates to God relates to his absolute unicity. We affirm that. This is ilm tawheed. Tawheed is the basic and most important belief. What the meaning of that oneness is, <clears throat> is something that we can never grasp as, it, as a reality that exists with the right of God. God's knowledge, God's speech reveals all things, it indicates <clears throat> all things that are manifest in his knowledge. Um, then God also blesses us, he has mercy on us in her human history by using human language in order to express his uncreated speech. So the Qur'an, the Gospel of Jesus, the Psalms of David, the Torah of Moses, the scrolls of Abraham, any revealed book in history that comes from God, <clears throat> it is a miraculous use of temporal language. Language that is created, language that exists in time and space in order to mirror the uncreated speech of God. And the word Qur'an also embodies that truth because the, the basic meaning of Qara'a is not to read. The basic meaning of Qara'a is Jama'a. It is to join together. So the Qur'an is that revealed speech of God that joins together in its marvelous language and its beautiful letters all that is in God's knowledge. It is all there implicitly. It is all there in indication. And the Furqan is when that Qur'an is um, expressed outwardly in such a way as to give us lots of insights and lots of knowledge and uh, you know specific understanding of that. Okay, does that help to make sense? Does that, Sidi Walid, would you like to add anything to that? I'd like him to be up here. He doesn't want to come up here. We should make him answer the questions. I would be so relieved. <coughs> what is the difference between Allah having life and Allah as al hayy Okay, so when in our theology we talk about the attributes as substantive descriptions of the essence of God, that God has life, haya, he has ilm, knowledge, he has irada, will, power, qudra, sam'a, hearing, basa, seeing, and he has kalam, speech. These are attributes of the essence of God. <clears throat> By virtue of having these attributes, then he is living God. He is Hay, and he is all-knowing, Alim, and he is Murid, he has will, he has Mashia, and he is also Al-Qadir, Al-Muqtadir, Al-Qadir, he has power. Um, he has the attribute of hearing. So he is Samia. He has the attribute of Basal, seeing. So he is Basir. He is, has the attributes of speech. So he is Mutakallim. We refer to these seven basic attributes by an unusual word. It's sort of a difficult word. It's the word ma'ani. The word ma'ana in Arabic 
is, is not an easy word to, you know, to define. It doesn't mean just meaning. It means also realities and things like that. But these are called the ma'ani, and we affirm them as attributes of the essence of God. These other attributes, like he is hayy, he is living, we call those sifatun ma'nawiyya. They are attributes that come from the ma'ani. They are attributes that reflect the ma'ani. And that distinction is in some ways a legal distinction also because of the fact that there were among Muslims certain people, again they're the Mu'tazila, uh, who do not speak about the attributes, who speak only about the essence. So they will say, huwa hayyun bi dhatihi, huwa alimun bi dhatihi, huwa muridun bi dhatihi. They say that God is living by virtue of his essence. He is knowing by virtue of his essence. He is willing by virtue of his essence. So for us, we said that's the minimum you must say. That if you deny that, that would be kufr. But we believe that the, the sound statement is the affirmation of these attributes. Kindly give us a brief hint about the knowledge of mulk and of malakut. Uh, these are things that we don't talk about in the aqidah. <clears throat> they are part of haqiqah, the, the realm of ultimate knowledge and ultimate reality. And they have basis in revelation for sure, no question about that. But um, they pertain to what in the realm of haqiqah we call maratib al-wujud. We can call levels of existence. Um, many people here have asked about dimensions of existence. And maybe you could use both words, but the thing is, when you talk about dimensions of existence, existence, maybe we're talking about things like parallel universes and, and things like that. Maratib al-wujud is a very profound teaching and it's also a kind of teaching which is not readily understood. But in Maratib al-wujud you have, for example, al-ahadiyya. You have the reality of God as God alone. In the absence of creation, كان الله ولا شيء معه God was and there was with him nothing. So we refer to that, we refer to that as ahadiyya, and God doesn't change. So therefore Imam al-Junaid says, ala ma alayhi kan, that God is now as he was. God does not change, he changes the world, he creates the world, but God is God as he always was, always was. So ahadiyya is usually regarded as the first of maratib al-wujud. It is the first of levels of existence. And then you have other levels that come from that. Uh, we have, for example, Jabarut, which is, they say, the world of lights. You know, before creation. It is uncreated. And then you have Malakut. Malakut is the creation of the realm of archetypes. What we call in Arabic, Amthal. And then you have the mulk, which is this world that we live in right now. So that's a very profound teaching. It is not required. And the Aqidah always wants to talk about required belief. And it also wants to talk about things that are understood by people. They're not understood by some people and not by others. Okay, And the Aqidah is the foundation upon which you can understand these other things because they must be understood in a way that is consistent with that basic platform. Um, but Malakut is the realm of the angels, it is the angelic world, it is the world of Amthal, and it is the spiritual world, and it is said to be infinitely more real than this world itself. 
And when people die, and they go into the barzakh, the intermediate world between this one and the resurrection, they go back into the malakut. The barzakh is malakuti. It is malakuti. It is real. And again, it is more real than this. You're totally awake there. And solid is solid. And, and, and pleasure is pleasure. And pain is pain. And the things are truly what they are. But in the world of malakut, the meaning of a thing or the ethical reality of a thing is also expressed in its form. And many of our great scholars believe that the things that exist in this world, they reflect these archetypes in the malakut. Um, you know, I don't know, I don't remember, you know, uh, I don't think that we've talked hardly anything about evolution but um, we might be able to do that a little bit tomorrow. But um, biologists of the 19th century, in the 19th century the talk about evolution was very common. Darwin wasn't, in fact Darwin doesn't use the word. Darwin in Origin of Species I don't believe ever uses the word evolution. You know, uh, he believes in evolution. And he's trying to prove it. He's also understating what he's saying. But talk about that was very common in the 19th century. In the 19th century, great scholars you know, knew about the fishes of the seas, of the ancient seas, the dinosaurs, the ancient mammals. They put them together. And um, they believed, most of them, in what they call creative evolution. They believe that there are different species and so forth, but God created them. Because one of the things about species is that they are uh, coherent and they are self-contained and they don't cross over. You, you, species is self-contained. You don't see one species becoming another species. You never see that. And species cannot mix, they cannot match. One of the ways that we know that donkeys and horses belong to the same species is that they can have offspring. You can have a mule. So that means they belong to the same species. But in the 19th century, a lot of 19th century biologists, they were very much concerned with the archetypical species. They wanted to discover what is the archetype of the human being that contains all possibilities of human beings. What is the archetype of the mollusk or of the horse or things like that. So for us, in our view of Melakut, uh, we would be interested in that idea. We might understand it differently, we might work with it differently, but it is a profound idea. And, you know, um, one of the aspects of modern science is that by shunning any kind of metaphysical um, dimension, uh, it impoverishes itself very, very greatly. 19th century scientists did not necessarily agree with that. Okay. According to what you have mentioned, uh, no one knows Allah, uh, you know, who does not know himself, right? And on the other side, قَوْلُهُ تَعَالَى وَمَا قَدَرُ اللَّهَ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ the aim of our creation is to know Allah. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Okay. وَمَعْنَ يَعْبُدُونَ أَيْ يَعْرِفُونَ So my question is about the maximum limit of knowing Allah from our perspective and if الْعَرِفُونَ بِاللَّهِ those people who have knowledge of God have already reached this position. Hmm. Uh, well, it's a big question. Uh, um, it's said that you can only know God to the degree that you know yourself. And in these <clears throat> nights that we've been here, I, I pray that Allah accept from us uh, you know, this effort and that He bless all of you and that he give you knowledge that grows in your hearts and is meaningful to you and that is correct. 
But when we are talking about possible being and necessary being, and God is not in us, and He's not out of us, He's not to the right and the left, what are we really talking about? We're really talking about us. We're saying that we have got to understand how we are, what we are, where we are, you know, uh, uh, the reality of ourselves and the world of analogy that we live in. And by understanding that we are this way and God is not that way, and that this is the nature of our contingency, of our complete dependency upon Him, you know, then we understand God in a way which is acceptable, which puts down a foundation that is powerful. Okay, so this is also part of knowing God through knowing ourselves. In you know, knowing about necessary being that we can never fathom by understanding the realities of possible being that we do understand. So <clears throat> this is very important and in understanding the human being there are many things to understand. Human beings are very special. Human beings uh, have a place in the universe that nothing else has. But nevertheless, the most basic thing that we have to understand about ourselves is the complete contingency of ourselves. You know, you are also the most remarkable thing in the universe. You are the one in whom all the names of God are manifest. You are the microcosm, the little world. world. Al-alim as In fact, the big world around you, it's not complete without you in it. Okay? So human beings are great and they have tremendous capacity. And when they believe in God and they are illuminated by the belief in God, they transform the world. You know, we say that the believer, the son and daughter of Adam, who truly believe and who realize that in themselves, they become Ruh al kaun They are the spirit of the world. The world comes to life through them. So these are amazing things. And in, as the human being perfects himself or herself, then you become even the macrocosm. And the, and the world is like a microcosm. But this is not the knowledge that is basic about us. This is like a crown and the only access to that crown is one of complete humility and complete honesty, uh, honesty about who we are in essence. So in essence, that I am insignificant and I am weak and I am incapable and I am totally contingent. Okay, and when we know that, and we are no longer deluded by our abilities, our gifts, our families, our wealth, our social position, and things like that, then we begin to see the miracle of how God works with us in life. And we see all of the good things that we have as gifts that are given by Him. So this is a big door of Ma'rifa. It is the basic door of Ma'rifa. And it's also called Mushahada the witnessing of God in our lives. And this knowledge of God is something that grows and grows and never ends. It is absolutely beautiful. And it is the meaning of the garden and the fire that grows and grows and grows in the knowledge of the One, in all of His majesty and all of His beauty and all of His perfection. Um, can you please offer advice on how to familiarize young children with theological teachings? Um, you didn't write that question, did you? No, okay. Uh, this is the one to ask about that. And also, that would be something to ask my wife. My wife is really good when it comes to teaching children. And I'm terrible. I mean, you can imagine. Look at the words I use. How could I speak to a child? You know, and um, you know, uh, I, I pray that Allah will enable me sometime 
to be able to speak simply, you know, the way that a mother can speak with her child. But um, I don't really know how to do that. It's difficult for me to teach teenagers and, and children, you know, but uh, I like to be very abstract and very philosophical. But it would be good for me to know how to answer that question. It would be very beneficial for me. And we have this sister here, you know, Nelly, mashallah, bless her, who's working on that right now. And also Aisha Gray Henry, who was here the first night. Um, you know, uh, some of you know her. She's an amazing person. You know, she's a Muslim who entered Islam back in the 19, maybe the late 60s or the early 70s. Uh, I think she came into Islam before I did. I came into Islam January the 2nd, 1970, on my mother's birthday. That's how I remember it. And um, that's a long time ago. The world was very different in those days. But I think she was in Islam before, if I'm not mistaken. And she's an amazing person. Also in American history, her family is a very important family. She's a descendant of Patrick Henry, the one who said, give me liberty or give me death. And um, she's not proud of that. She doesn't like all the things that Patrick Henry did. But she comes from a really important family. And she has a publishing house called Fonce Vitae. It's in Latin means the fountain of life. And you can go, she has a beautiful house in Kentucky. And um, you know, it's all in her basement. I've been there many times. Beautiful books. And she produces wonderful books. And right now she's working on Al Ghazali for children. Our sister Farida here is helping her with that. And um, inshallah, maybe we can also get her to help us on this project. We'd like to learn how do you teach this to children. This poem was written for children. As if you read ahead you'll see. We're not going to get there. But I teach it the way that you don't teach children. But, um, you know, one of the things we have to remember about children, children are all awliya. They're all saints. Children are born as awliya. They have good fitrah. And that's why also we have to be really good to children. We don't abuse them, we don't beat them, we don't curse them, we don't say bad things to them. Because they're awliya. You know, that's not pleasing to Allah. Children are a big amana. They're a big trust. We have to be very good to them. And inshallah, we should be, the children understand this stuff in, instinctively, so we should be able to, to tell it to them. And this is a great gift. Um, my wife is really good at things like that. She loves children's literature. And if anybody here knows children's literature, she'd love to talk with you. She can talk about it for hours. But again, children's literature is able to say things that are very profound in really simple ways. And the ability to simplify is one of the greatest gifts of intellect. You know, I mean, when we write the books that we write, if we're honest and if we're good scholars, we want to make it as simple as we can. Because you want people to understand and also you want your error to be clear. Um, Karl Marx, have you ever read Karl Marx? You know, uh, Karl Marx has, if you read him in German, he has sentences that are two pages long. The Germans in his time loved to do that. They call it Schachtelsatz, they call it boxcar sentence. It's like a train, you know, that, uh, you know, it goes for miles and miles and then the caboose comes at the end. So, in German, the verb comes at the end. And if you read Marx, you have to get, where's the verb, where's the verb, you know. But in many ways, it's because although Marx was a, a very powerful social critic and, um, you know, the left has always been very powerful in the West in analyzing oppression and in showing how exploitation works. They just don't have a solution, that's the problem. They don't know how to take care of the problem, but they're very conscious of the problem. So he had a lot of insights, but also there are a lot of contradictions and a lot of confusions. And the way that he writes covers that up. And you have a lot of other writers, like there was one Marcuse, who was very famous in the 1960s. 
And he was the same way. It's like he talks about profound things, but it's so difficult, it's so obscure. And really good scholarship is not that way. Make it clear, make it simple. And then we will say, where are we right? right? Where are we wrong? Where is the mistake? So, inshallah, may we learn you know, how to um, say these things in a way that is um, meaningful to children and learn how to teach our children. Uh, is the Qur'an a creation or is it an existence? Was it, did it pre-exist? Okay, so again, uh, there is divine speech which is uncreated and which certainly exists and necessarily exists. But this is an attribute of God. And it is an attribute of God, as you have heard many times now, which is extremely similar to knowledge itself, to omniscience. Uh, knowledge simply manifests and speech points. Speech yadul, it indicates that thing. But they are about the same thing. The infinite multiplicity of all the things God knows with no multiplicity in God. His knowledge is one. His knowledge manifests itself in all those things that are known. But there is no plurality like that in God. This is why unicity is the secret of secrets. The absolute oneness of God is the greatest secret of all. And he has a speech which is also a speech of unicity that perfectly indicates all things that is known without sound, without language, without letter, without composition, without temporality. This is his attribute. Then God creates speech that reflects that which he knows and that about which he speaks. You have the tablet, the lower, <clears throat> you know, the tablet of light in which God writes his decree. The angels write it. And if the, all the trees were pins and all the oceans were seas, they would be exhausted before the words of God would be exhausted. But that's talking about the created word, the word that is language, the word that is composition, the word that is written by the angels. They write it in time and space. And it perfectly reflects what is unwritten. And it is a multiplicity that is so great that if all the oceans were ink and all the trees were pins, the oceans would be, existed, would be exhausted before it's ever written. Okay? But the speech that it writes about is not like that. The speech it writes about is utterly one. Okay? And these are amazing things. These are amazing truths. And um, so, and the Qur'an, which is revealed by God, is revealed in perfect language, beautiful language. We said in the first night that we were here that the Arabic language is extremely ancient. You know, the, the, the family it belongs to is called Afro-Asian. Used to be called Hamidic-Semitic. But in that family, which is a big family, Hebrew, Aramaic, Ethiopic, um, ancient Egyptian, Coptic, Berber, Somali, Hausa, um, many tongues. In that family, which has been studied very carefully, the most ancient of the languages in it is Arabic. It's right there with, you could take Thamudic also, it's very ancient. The language of Thamud, which is written in the deserts of Arabia. You know, but Arabic is extremely ancient. It was preserved by the Arabian Peninsula. No invaders could come. The Arabian Peninsula is, is, an, is an amazing uh, creation. And then it was also preserved by the pilgrimage that was instituted uh, by Abraham. So the pilgrimage keeps the tribes, the sacred months, and so forth. Uh, it, keep, it enables them to live together 
despite the fact they have no government, they have no king. That God made the Kaaba, the house of God, and the sacred man. He made it Qiyaman lin nas, shahr al haram, and the sacred months, or the sacred month. Okay, this is true. It's like they don't have a king, but they have the Kaaba, and they have the sacred month, and al hadi wal qala'id, and they have the sacrificial animals that are being sent to Mecca, and the qala'id, the garlands that are on them. Because the pre Islamic Arabs, they honored that. They preserved the rights of pilgrimage and they preserved the sacred months, which were one third of the year. So no fighting, no war. And uh, they kept that very faithfully. Many of the early commentators, you see that in Qabari, they say that a man would meet in the sacred months the man who killed his father or the man who killed his brother, but he would not touch him. And Allah preserved that also because if they violated the sanctity of the house or the month, He retaliated. Because this had to be kept that way. And this is also what kept the Arabic as one, Arabic language as one language. Because Arabs from Hadramaut and from the Yemen and from Bahrain and from the east and Nejd and the north, they can all come to the pilgrimage. And they will speak. They have their different modes of speaking, but they understand each other. They intermarriage, intermarry. They're able to make peace with each other. This is amazing. You can talk for hours about that. So the Arabic language is ancient, and this is very important. Whenever we find ancient languages like Sanskrit, Greek is pretty old, but it's not as old as Sanskrit. You know, uh, ancient languages are very pure. And they're extremely exact. And they're very rich. Arabic is a fantastic example. You've looked at Lisan al-Arab, right? It's a big dictionary. It's all the language of the Qur'an and the Hadith and that first generation. And how many words do you understand when you read that? I know you know Arabic better than I do. You know, but it has words in it that like... We even take sometimes the pre-Islamic poetry and if we've not been trained, it's like... What are these words? You know, and they're very exact words, very precise words. And language and thought go together. If you have a powerful language, you also have very powerful thought. So what were these people? What kind of people were these? And all ancient languages are like that. I would say that ancient languages are superior to modern languages. And many people would disagree on that. They would say, no, you can't make that distinction. That's prejudice on your part. But ancient languages are extremely rich. Even if we take the English language, if you go back to Saxon that was spoken in the days of the Prophet, extremely beautiful language, rich language, expressive language, 30 names of God, names of the devil, you know, names about almost everything in our vocabulary in Islam. Al-Ajal, for example, you've got it there in Saxon. Al-Sa'id, Al-Shaqid, you've got it there in Saxon. Exactly. So what does that tell about human beings? It's very, very interesting. In other words, these human beings in the past, what kind of people were they? If they spoke a language that I myself am not even the equal to using. You know, these were not backward people. These were people that were pure human. And also when we study primitive religion, primitive religions all believe in one God. They're not animistic. The great studies that were done by that, by Wilhelm Schmidt in the 20th century. We talked about that the first day. And this is why people like Toynbee, he says that the most advanced human being was Paleolithic human being that human beings of the old stone age, which ends around 7,000 BC, he said they were the best of all. He said, and why? Because look at language, look at primitive religion, things like, but he said they were not builders, they were not makers of cities, they were hunter-gatherers, they were people who lived very materially simple lives, but they were the best people of all. Toynbee, that's one of, a very important part, you know, of his uh, study of history. And uh, we say about that, ثُلَّةٌ مِّنَ الْأَوَّلِينَ وَقَلِيلٌ مِّنَ الْآخِرِينَ 
again, cognitive frames. You see, you get the cognitive frame of evolution, which maybe we can talk about tomorrow, and then primitive is backward. The further back you go, the stupider you become. You know, people are just cavemen. They don't know anything. And we make cartoons about that. And we draw pictures, pictures of things we never saw. We were never there. You know, there, there were types of humanoids that we found in the fossil record. We're not related to any of them. And, you know, we usually have a skull here and a skull there. You know, we don't know what was there in the past. And, you know, if we are scientific people and honest people, we will avoid judgment about things that we don't know. But we don't tend to do that. We have cognitive frames that paint the whole picture, and then you get the artist to come in, and he shows you how the human being was bent over an ape-like, and then he stands up and so forth. That's an artist's imagination. Nothing scientific about that. And we're not even related to those people. So Arabic is an ancient tongue and a beautiful tongue. And the letters embody the meanings of the word. Qaf. Well, Quran al Majid. Qaf. You know, the letter Qaf has secrets. One of them is consolation. The letter Qaf has the power of consolation. And, you know, these, these letters then make these beautiful words. And you have that in Arabic, and you have that in the whole family of Afro-Asian languages. You had it in ancient Egyptian, the same thing. You know, so it's powerful language. Really beautiful language. And then the Qur'an comes into that. Arabic is the perfect vehicle to receive this message and to point to the uncreated speech. Umar would say, if I lose a camel's halter, I can find it in the Qur'an. And what surah in the Qur'an talks about camel's halters? But what he means is that all the knowledge of God is here. All the will of God is here. It says, I have to be able to understand it. I have to be able to relate to it. And, you know, we ask Allah to give us that ability to really love the Qur'an. And I, I know Egyptians are, are especially gifted in that. That's my belief. That um, Egyptians have... A, a relation to the Qur'an, you know, which is really profound. And I mean, any, many of the people here too, like when they come to me, they talk about the Qur'an. You can see these are people who really love it. They listen to it. They think about it. But it's an amazing book. And, and it is an eternal, you know, miracle. So there is then the uncreated speech of God. And then there is the created speech of God. And there is the created speech of God that points to the uncreated speech of God. And that's what the Qur'an does. And this is why we have lots of adab when we talk about the Qur'an. Um, yes? Yeah, will the Qur'an have the same form in the afterlife? Mm -hmm. um, I've never been asked that question before and I don't really know the answer to it. Do you know the answer to it? My, um, after saying that I don't know the answer to the question, I would believe that in the, Quran, in the, in the hereafter you'll have the whole Qur'an. You know, and you'll have the whole Gospel. And you'll have the whole Torah and all the Psalms and all, all of that. Because that's one of the treasures of this world. And all the prophets will be there. And all their communities will be there. And all the truth will be there. And, and I hope that we will see. I hope we'll be there together in the deceit. Uh, why can't history prove the stories in the Qur'an like the splitting of the sea with Moses? Or is it proved and we happen to not know it? How can we train to use our reason, intellect, more efficiently? Is it normal to find what we learn in Aqidah too overwhelming and a lot to take? So, three good questions. Um, why can't we prove the stories of the Qur'an like the splitting of the sea with Moses? Um, first of all, whether we can prove that or not, this is something to be studied. A lot of times 
when you do really careful study, you discover things that you never imagined to find. And um, if the sea opens up like that, and then the children of Israel go through, and then it closes back, I mean, what evidence are you going to have after that? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, but there are lots of things to look at. And, you know, if you look at the, if you take the human record seriously, as for that which benefits human being, it remains in the earth. That has different interpretations. But, you know, I believe that we, you know, um, as Muslims, are people who need to, we, have a, we are beginning in this time to use the treasures that have been brought to us in the 19th and 20th century. In the 19th and 20th century, human beings gain knowledge of science, they gain knowledge of methodology, they gain knowledge of history like they had never had before. And we have interpretations of that. And those interpretations are often ones that are not especially profound and they're not necessarily the interpretations of believers. But when you look at history, you can also find different things. So don't ever say that you can't prove it. You know, once we begin to look at these things, especially using archaeology and other things like that, then, you know, maybe we will find things there. But we believe in this because it is revealed to us and because it is possible. In terms of what is talked about, it is not impossible. It is contrary to custom. It is contrary to customary experience. But God rules the world of possibility absolutely. He does whatever He wills. So we believe that. And inshallah we can affirm that. Things like the flood too. You might ask the same question about the flood. Um, we'd have to know how to study things. Have to know what to look for. We have to imagine it properly. One of the interesting things about the flood is that everybody on earth practically believes in it. All Native Americans believe that there was a universal flood and that they came to Turtle Island, you know, to the Americas after that. The Saxons believed in it, the Indo-Europeans believed in it, the Babylonians believed in it, the Sumerians believed in it, the Chinese believed in it, the Hindus believed in it. The, the exception in human history is to find people who did not mention it. Not necessarily that they didn't believe in it, like the ancient Egyptians. The ancient Egyptians, we have no record that they believed in a flood. Okay, so uh, why is that the case? Maybe they didn't know. Maybe they didn't have that in their knowledge. But then also this was the land of the Nile. And the Nile was the giver of life. And the Nile flooded. And when the Nile used to flood, especially before human beings began to live here, it flooded for hundreds of kilometers in all directions. And it was impossible to live here. And in order to live in the Nile Valley, which begins, you know, after the Sahara becomes desert, you know, 4000 BC, 3500 BC, you already have pharaohs, you know, then you have to have a complete change of the social system in a way that really requires prophecy. It's a radical change in human life, but you've got to be able to have the blessing of the flood and to benefit from the flood and not be destroyed by it. So therefore, when I see that the ancient Egyptians are an exception, then I would say, but also these are people who have a certain belief about their flood. So these are things, inshallah, to be studied. And may we study these things carefully. May we have methodologies to do that. And may we be believers. Bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. Um, how can we train our reason? Uh, we've talked about that a little bit before. I believe that I want to write a book about this. Uh, pray for me that I succeed. I think we really have to have in English good 
material. Our theology is beautiful. It is a profound theology. And we need to be able to write it in good English, have it in Spanish and German and French. Again, one of the questions that I was asked here during the break is, is it good to talk about things like this with disbelievers? And most people who are disbelievers, they are disbelievers because, first of all, what they have seen from believers totally turns them off. Most people who are atheists or agnostics are that way because of the things they've seen, quote unquote, believers do. And like, if this is religion, I don't want any part of it. And then also, most of the people who don't believe, they don't know how to think about it. They don't have the words, they don't have the cognitive frames, they don't have the, 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 the tools to do it. So when we teach our Aqidah, one of the main things that we're doing is giving you words, giving you concepts, necessary being, possible being, impossible being, temporality, existence after nothingness, the, the change, the meaning of change, the attributes and the essences. And once you begin to think like that, and you, uh, inshallah you'll see this, it becomes very meaningful to you. Uh, you know, one of the parts of the question here is, is it normal to find what we learn in Aqidah too overwhelming and a lot to take? And, you know, um, I think that's normal, you know, um, because of the fact that we have to assimilate new words. We have to assimilate new ways of thinking. We have to examine the way we thought before. And that takes highly intelligent people, and you are highly intelligent people. But that requires us to listen and to wait. And then I begin to get it. Then I begin to get it. And as I said before, when I began to study this theology for the first time, which was in 1984, um, I loved it. I loved to study it. But really, it's like, it was difficult for me. It was difficult for me. But then it gets easier. It gets easier. And also, uh, the same man who told me to study it, he then told me a few years later, he said, now translate it into English and write a commentary for your aunt. So I have an aunt that I think she doesn't, not alive anymore, but I loved her very much and she was very good. And her cousin came to see me in the Hijaz. And so he said, write her a commentary for this and then put it on tape for her so she can listen to it. I did. And then he said, put it away, don't use it ever. <clears throat> now I can make a book from it, but it'd be much better. At that time, it's still sort of elementary, you know, but that process of translating it and making a commentary, that made me have to understand it. And I would go to other teachers and I'd say, what does this really mean? You know, how does change indicate... I had a big problem with that. How does change in indicate temporality? After a while, they said, oh, wow, I got it. I finally got it, but you have to work at it. So this is why we have to, uh, we have to listen. لَوْ كُنَّا نَسْمَعُ أَوْ نَعْقِلُ مَا كُنَّا مَا كُنَّا مِنْ أَصْحَابِ السَّعِيرِ Is that how it goes? لَوْ كُنَّا نَسْمَعُ أَوْ نَعْقِلُ مَا كُنَّا فِي أَوْ مِنْ فِي أَصْحَابِ السَّعِيرِ Right? So we have to listen, but it means listen, سَمَعَ الْقَبُولِ because you can't just change like that. It takes time. It's harder than learning language. You learn language and you hear the word again, you forget it, you heard it again, you forget that after a while you begin to get it and it holds. So, you know, because we're here for a short time, we try to do this in a short time. Whereas maybe in terms of education, it would be much better if we took a long time and just little lessons and talked about it. But, you know, we don't, and it's recorded, so you can listen to it again if you want, and you can listen to it again. But to assimilate these things is really important, and that's why also in our tradition, you are taught and then you teach. 
You know, you get the lesson and then you teach others. You teach your friends and they teach you and then we learn it bi idnillahi ta'ala. Why did Allah create Ada? Why did God create customary experience? Anybody have an answer to that question? Uh, we don't ask why, how, when, what, where with regard to Allah. But in all things he did, he did it for wisdom. And God created a world here for us to be tested in. A world in which it is possible to believe and possible to disbelieve. A world in which it is possible to believe that the fire actually burns in and of itself. That nothing has power over it. And where you could even worship fire. And you could even worship the sun. So he creates a world like that for the test. And towards the end of time, as the world comes to an end, and the time of the Antichrist, for example, and the time of uh, you know, the Ashrat of the Sa'a, the big signs of the Day of Judgment, then the Aada begins to break down. It begins to unravel. And Malakut begins to take over the realm of the Mulk. So the Aada, I would say, is very much here as a blessing. It's a way that we live, we eat, we feed, you know, we plant our crops and we expect them to grow. They don't always grow. You look at the things that you farm, that you cultivate. أَأَنْتُمْ تَزْرَعُونَهُ Here, zara means تُنْبِتُونَهُ Are you the one who makes it grow? Or do we, God, make it grow? Zara here doesn't mean haratha. It means تُنْبِتُونَهُ you, plant, you plow and you plant the seed. Do you make the plant grow? Do you make it come up and grow into a plant? Do you make it produce? Okay, but basically we expect it to do that because that's the ada. And we know we can get a living that way. We can have cultures, we can have families, we can have civilizations. But it's all part of the divine test. How are we doing for time? 10 o'clock. We should stop, right? Inshallah. We have good questions here. And um, inshallah, tomorrow night, um, you know, we will meet uh, for our last session. I hope I can come back, and I hope that if I come back, we can get back together. But uh, tomorrow, inshallah, we'll try to talk about these really important questions like Ada, like customary experience, cause and effect, free will and good and evil. Uh, that's difficult. I'm not, I, I hope that I get ready for that, inshallah, and I hope that I can tell it to you in a way that is correct and in a way that is beneficial. اللهم وفقنا لما تحبه وترضاه وجعلنا من عبيدك السعداء وأمتنا على كلمة الهدى علمنا ما ينفعنا ووفقنا للعمل بما علمتنا به وجعل ما نحن فيه خالصا مخلصا لوجهك الكريم يا رب العالمين اللهم اجعل تجمعنا هذا تجمع مرحوما وتفرقنا بعده تفرقا معصوما لا شقيا منا ولا محروما آمين 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 يا رب العالمين History is really amazing though and uh, what historians know about history is very little and often their historical methodology is one that almost keeps them from seeing the picture Arnold Toynbee for example who is a great historian was very unpopular among historians until, and maybe he still is to some extent, but that's because Toynbee wanted to make history work. I want to be able to tell you about history and what happens in history, not just to give you the details, you know, about this particular crisis or that crisis. Again, he wanted to get beyond specialization that if we've got all these books, all these journals, and I can't tell you something about civilization and the fall and rise of it, then what's the purpose? And Toynbee used to say that, you know, historians need to beware of sociologists because sociologists are trying to make sense of society. And historians never do. Some do. But, you know, Toynbee, when he did that, I mean, this was a big violation of 
the terms of the deal in the eyes of a lot of historians. You know, and uh, he said one of his, well, I won't say what he said, but uh, you know, one of his teachers, he asked him what is history, he said one damn thing after another. It's one damn thing after another. But he said, you know, what can I do with that? It's like, I want to make sense of it. I want to make sense of it. But when we talk about history, really you especially, you know, Islamic history is absolutely profound. And most Muslims and most non-Muslims have no idea what we did. And to bring this to life and to bring this to light is extremely important. And even these things like the history of the prophets, the history of religions in the past, it's a rich, rich field. And, you know, we need to be involved in that. And we need to do it very carefully, and we are believers. You know, and that doesn't mean we're going to make uh, crazy museums where we see men riding dinosaurs and things like that, like the Christian right does in the United States. But like, let's study this really honestly and carefully, and look at what is there. And um, there are a lot of amazing things. Thamud, for example. Who were these people, Thamud? They existed. They have their writing all over the Arabian Peninsula. Their script is almost certain, I believe their script is the script from which Phoenician and Hebrew and Greek and Latin comes. It's much older than 1200 BC, which is Phoenician. I would say it goes back way before that. You know, so these are things to be studied carefully. The Arabian Peninsula is the richest repository of Neolithic human beings that we know in the world. And who studies that? You know, these are really important things. Again, you know, may, may we study these things well. There are a lot of leads. You know, the, the people who settled Damascus, the Arameans, they studied Damascus, Hemps and Hama. What did they call themselves Arameans? What's that from? They spell it Alif Ra'min. That's Iram. They say Aram. Or they say Aram. But it is Iram. And where did they come from? They came from the deserted quarter. They came from the very land of Ad. Big deal. But that's, where they, that's who they were. And when Babylon wanted to enculturate them, it could not do it. And Toynbee's wise about that. He says that's because the Arameans had a cultural past that made them very proud of who they were and gave them an identity that they felt was superior to Babylon. See, that's just a hint in history. But like that to me is ding, you know, it's like, like this is significant. Who also came from the deserted quarter? The Fayumis, the people of Fayum. They come out of the deserted quarter. There were four people in Neolithic Arabia that we know of. There were Fayumis some of the ancient Egyptians. Maybe there are other cultures, but the Fayum culture is from the deserted quarter. We have very good evidence of that. And then you have also um, the Sumerians. The Sumerians who are the ones who make the first civilization of Mesopotamia. They come from the, from the Arabian Peninsula. And they believed that it was the land of Noah. They believed in the flood. They would have second burials of their dead, you know, in Bahrain and in Dilmun, as they called it, they, Mecca didn't exist in those days. That's thousand, two thousand years before Abraham's time. But they knew that it was sacred land, and they believed that Noah was buried there. They didn't call him Noah; they called him Utupishti. You know, so these are things that you know. If you and I look at, <clears throat> you know, we may have a different understanding of it. Very, very interesting. And, you know, may we be careful about how we do this, may we be honest about how we do this, but, um, you know, we, we have to use the tools that we have. And we talked about rooting science yesterday. That's profound. But also, like, rooting history, studying history. You know, I come from the United States. We're Americans. And the history of Islam in America, you would not believe. We have a history, for example... You know, New York City. Who founded Coney Island? Do you know? 
Do you know? The son of Murad Rais, whose name was Antony Janssen von Sali. He was a renegade. He was a Muslim who had a copy of the Quran. This Coney Island, which is Brooklyn, you know, Coney Island was established by a Dutch Muslim. You know, really. And everybody knew it. In fact, I mean, everybody knew it. And, um, you know, who's the descendants of uh, Anthony Fansali? Humphrey Bogart. Humphrey Bogart has a Muslim great grandfather. And also the Vanderbilts, the whole Vanderbilt families, the McKinley families. These are all descendants of Muslims. You know, and we have Muslims that were in America, I believe, before Columbus ever came. In 1312, Mansa, Kankan, Abu Bakr, the king of Mali, the wealthiest empire in the world, sent 2,400 boats with warriors across the Atlantic, and he got to the other side. We have sound archaeological evidence for that. And when the Spanish come to America and Cortez goes into Mexico City, he said, I found many mosques and many pagan temples and many houses. It's not disputed. That statement is not disputed by any historian. They just say there were no Muslims in America before Columbus. And he doesn't know what he's saying. He is deluded. No, he's not deluded. Columbus, and, and, and Cortez, Pizarro says the same thing. So it's like, as long as we're not writing the history, no one knows how to understand that. But once we, you know, and again, Westerners usually, what they don't understand about us is so profound. It's so profound. They don't understand anything. So we understand that. We've got to bring that into the picture. Uh, there's so many interesting things. And may Allah enable us really with enthusiasm you know, to learn this knowledge and to study sciences and history and everything. And um, that will be, I believe, a great contribution, inshallah. We'll see you tomorrow. Hafizakum <clears> Allah. <throat>